Good morning. morning. Good. You're awake this morning. What a beautiful, beautiful morning the Lord has given us. What what blessing we're having today, this beautiful sunshine. So I understand come Tuesday, when it's supposed to be fall, it's going to be back up in the 80s. The poor weatherman just can't get it right, can he? Welcome, everyone, to the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for this time we have together to worship you, to fellowship with our brothers and sisters. Join us today and be with us as we praise you and worship you today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Are there any announcements? Good morning. Today is the day. It is the heifer walk. Um... So I looked at the weather, and it's supposed to be 65 and sunny, so it sounds pretty good. Um, I hope you all can come and walk. Um, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who uh, signed up to help and provide things. So thank you. number of opportunities to serve and participate. If there are no others, if you stand, if you're able, for the call to worship and the praise singing. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon the name of the Lord. God's love and mercy are given daily for each of us. God's forgiveness and Praise be to God, who deals so kindly with us. Lord, help us offer the same compassion to others.
my overcome. Just 
reminds me of the heifer walk. Um, so I look forward to seeing everyone in some capacity this afternoon, but I wanted to let you know that we have a new song that we're going to introduce today. It's called The Blessing, and if the words sound familiar to you, it's Pastor Mark often uses it as his benediction, So, but it's a beautiful song, and I hope you enjoy it. Generations of your family, 
your children and their children and their children. May his presence be before you and behind you and beside you and around you. He is with you, he is with you, he is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and your rejoicing. He is for you, he is for you. Thank you, praise team. If the children will listen up, Anna has a story for you. You big folks can listen up too. Maybe I'm gonna get it. I gotta have my hands free. So, um, Dick mentioned it earlier, all you children out there, what season is coming? Fall, Fall or as I like to call it, autumn, one of my favorite seasons. Some of you will get that, some of you won't, that's okay. Um, that is the season that's coming. And when I think of autumn or fall, I think of apples. I think of other things too, but apples are very symbolic. It's the harvest season. We're harvesting apples. And I like to think about the different kinds of apples. They all look very, very different. And they all have names. In fact, if you go to the store, they have signs all over with the different names of the, the apples. And these fun little stickers. These are little stickers. Each, each apple had its own sticker with its own name on it. So we've got, and I'm going to put, put my gloves on before I start handling these. Before I start handling the apples that have been washed freshly this morning. I've got I have a red delicious apple. And I have a Fuji apple. And see, they don't even all stand up. They're so different. They don't stand up very well. I have a Gala apple. And I have a Golden Delicious apple. And these are all pretty good apples for eating, but they all look very different on the outside. Some of them are fat, and some of them are skinny, and some of them are dark, and some of them are light, and some of them have crooked stems, and some of them have stripes on them. They all look very, very different. The Bible talks about the apple of God's eye, or the apple of my eye, is mentioned a couple of times in the Old Testament when people are talking to one another. Does anybody have an idea about what the apple of your eye means? What do you think that means? They're full of the spirit. <laughs> it means that they're, they're um, like your favorite. And the Bible says that we are the apple of God's eye. We've been made in God's image. We talked in Sunday school last week about how we were made in God's image, but we all look different on the outside. But something you might not know is apples have something in common. I mean, you know that they have a lot of things in common, like they all grow on trees and 
they all have seeds and stuff. But there's something that makes every apple the same. Get out my handy dandy knife. Inside the apple, if I can get this cut right. Nope, cannot cut with gloves on. Okay, you guys can't eat these apples now because I can't cut with the gloves on. You see that? Sophia, what does that look like to you? Mm -hmm. The Golden Delicious has a star in the middle of it. This one's harder to see, but the Fuji has a star in the middle of it. Oh, that was the gala. The Fuji does have a star. And the Red Delicious has a star in the middle. So no matter what we have on the outside, what denomination we claim, what race we claim, no matter what it looks like on the outside, whether we have some bumps and bruises on the outside or we're kind of lumpy, we're tall, skinny, whatever things that we have on the outside we're still made in God's image, and we're all pretty much the same inside. We all have the same core. You know about apple cores, right? So we all have the same. And we need to remember that just because somebody looks different from us or sounds different from us or smells different from us, we still need to treat them like the apple of God's eye, because we're all made in God's image. And we all need that same good treatment. So let's pray. God, thank you for making us all unique and for calling us by our names. Thank you for making the core of our being something that seeks after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mona. That just goes to show that you can teach an old dog new tricks. I did not know about the star in the middle. And I'm one of those elderly guys. Oh, no. How many knew that? Oh, good. Some did. Our um, service cup for this Sunday and next Sunday is for HPI. Pepper Project. Our offertory thought, to acquire wisdom is to love oneself. People who cherish understanding will prosper. Will the ushers please come forward?
Thank you, Candace. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for again for this beautiful day. We thank you for these tithes and offerings that we've given today. Just use them to glorify your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're able, stand for the hymn, Lord, I am fondly, earnestly, 514. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. From Matthew, chapter 20, beginning with verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out, and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing around here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. 
But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour. And they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Did you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is God's word for us today. May God add his blessings to it. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today in worship, giving you our praise and thanks, eager to hear what you have to say to us. So we pray, Lord, that you would just help us to quiet our minds so that we may be open and ready to receive your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This Wednesday will mark six months since coronavirus restrictions began here in Indiana. Now, some restrictions have been lifted. However, there are many other restrictions which still remain in place. Now, that being said, we Hoosiers have far fewer restrictions than folks who are living in New York or out in California. And so we can be thankful for that. Now, this pandemic has left many Americans saying that's not fair when it comes to restrictions that have been placed upon them. Take face masks, for example. If you live in South Dakota or Iowa, there is no statewide mandate that says that you have to wear a face mask in public. However, if you live here in Indiana or Ohio or New York and numerous other states, you are required to wear a face mask in public. And that's just not fair. South Dakota, you don't. Indiana, you do. Or how about dining at restaurants? If you live in South Dakota, there are no limits as to how full the restaurant can be. Here in Indiana, Restaurants are limited to 50 to 75 percent capacity. If you live in New York, restaurants have been finally allowed to have indoor dining at 25 percent capacity. Now that's not fair. South Dakota has one standard, Indiana another, New York still another. And then there are social gatherings. Once again, there are no limits in South Dakota. If you're in South Dakota, you can gather as many people together as you want. But here in Indiana, the limit is at 250. And in the state of New York, if you're part of the state that has been allowed to enter into phase four, you are limited to a gathering of up to 50 people. Now, of course, there is no limit to the number of people who can gather to riot in New York City. But if you gather to worship in church on Sunday morning, you are limited to 50% capacity of the building in which your worship service is. And that's not fair. One more area, that of traveling. Now, if you travel to South Dakota or Indiana from New York... There are no mandatory requirements that you must enter into a two-week two quarantine when you enter South Dakota or Indiana. However, if you are from South Dakota and traveling to New York or Indiana and traveling to New York, you are required to enter into a two-week quarantine when you arrive in that state. 
Does that make any sense? That's not fair. Now, when we were children, we were hardwired with a sense of fairness. How many of you remember accusing your mom or dad with words like these? Her piece of cake is bigger than mine. That's not fair. Why do I have to go to bed now and she doesn't have to? That's not fair. You love him more than you love me. That's not fair. Why do I always have to wear hand-me-downs? And my older brother and sister always gets new clothes. That's not fair. When we were children, unfairness felt like a matter of life and death. And when we were children, we were taught to believe in a concept called justice. We were taught that justice is a system of rewards and punishment that makes the world go round. Good behavior is rewarded. Bad behavior is punished. For example, if you're a child and you finish eating everything on your plate, then you are rewarded by either being able to eat a cookie for dessert or a piece of cake for dessert, or you can go outside and play. But if you're a child and you don't eat everything on your plate, then you're punished by not being able to eat dessert or not being able to go out and play with your friends. Now, as we grow older, we learn that this concept of justice doesn't always operate the way we learned about it as children. Not every good deed is rewarded, and there are many evil deeds that are left unpunished. We don't always get that promotion or raise that we've worked so hard for and feel we deserve. Sometimes the boss promotes someone who's not worked as long or as hard as we have. And yet we are able to find solace and satisfaction in knowing that though things on earth might be out of whack, there is a God who is just. We may not have learned the song that Moses taught the Israelites to sing. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let me quote a portion of it. I will proclaim the name of the Lord, O praise the greatness of our God, he is the rock, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just, is he. We may not have learned this song when we were children, as the children of Israelites did, but we believe in what that song teaches and proclaims, that there is a God who is faithful and just. And there have been many songs about God's justice composed and sang throughout the centuries. But perhaps no song summarizes the Old Testament teaching about God's justice better than Psalm chapter 62, verse 12b. It says, Surely you reward each person according to what he has done. Surely you, O God, reward each person according to what he has done. To rephrase it, God blesses those who obey him and God punishes those who disobey him. Before today's text in Matthew chapter 20, we go back to chapter 19 of Matthew. Jesus is talking and teaching his disciples about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Matthew writes in chapter 19, verse 25, that when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished. They were dumbfounded. They were amazed. They were shocked beyond belief. You see, they thought that riches were a sign of God's favor. What does Psalm 62, 62, verse 12b says? Surely God rewards each person according to what he has done. 
So they thought riches were a sign of God's favor. And in their eyes, this rich young man who came to Jesus must have been one totally righteous dude. After all, God is just. God rewards each person according to what he has done. And therefore, since he was so rich, well, he must have done a lot of good things. But if, as Jesus is teaching, it's extremely difficult for the rich to get into heaven, what chance do the rest of us have? And so Peter tells Jesus, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? And then in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, Jesus tells a parable to help answer Peter's question. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out about 6 o'clock in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And he agreed to pay them the normal daily wage, a denarius. And if you put that in today's modern economic terms here in the United States, about $200 a day. That's what he agrees to pay them. And then he sends them out to work. And about 9 o'clock in the morning, he's back in the marketplace looking for more workers, and he sees other people standing there, and so he hires them, and he tells them he would pay them whatever is right at the end of the day. And so they go, and they work, begin working in the vineyard. And then the landowner goes to the marketplace at noon, and then about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he does the same thing. He finds workers who, who need a job, he hires them, he sends them out to work, and agrees to pay them whatever is right at the end of the day. And then it's about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, only one more hour to work for the day. And he returns to the marketplace, and he sees some more folks who are doing nothing. They're looking for work, and, he's, and he says, you also, you go, you work in my vineyard, and I'm going to pay you to work there. Well, they go, and they work, and six o'clock rolls around. The whistle blows. It's quitting time. It's time to pay the workers, and so he tells the manager, of the, the owner tells the manager of the vineyard to call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group that was hired to the first group that was hired. And so the workers who were hired about five o'clock, they come and each one of them receives a denarius, $200 for their work. And the workers who had been hired at six o'clock in the morning, they're, they're sitting back there, they're observing what's going on, and, and you can imagine what they're thinking in their minds. Oh, they worked one hour and got paid $200? We've worked 12 hours? Let's see, that means we're going to get paid $2,400 today? Wow! That's not bad for a day's work. So the manager calls those who were hired at 3 o'clock, and they were paid $200 for their labor. Not $200 an hour, but $200 for three hours of work. And then the manager calls those who are at noon and at 9 o'clock in the morning, and, and they also receive $200 for their time of work. And finally, the manager calls those who were hired at 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, they thought they were going to receive more, but each one of them also receives $200 or a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner, saying, ah, these last men, these guys who were hired at 5 o'clock, they worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who born the heat of the day, and we worked our butts off. And the sun, I mean, we got sunburned because of it. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for $200 a day? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired the last the same 
as I give to you? Don't I have a right to do with my money what I want to do with it? Or are you envious because I am generous? Now, as I have read and reread and thought about this story, I keep wondering why the landowner paid the workers the way he did. I mean, couldn't he have prevented a lot of anger and frustration and grumbling by paying those first whom he had hired first? The guys he hired at 6 o'clock in the morning. They would have got their pay, they would have left, he could have called in the 9 o'clock group and so forth. He still would have paid each party $200 as they agreed to, but he would have avoided that conflict that appearance of being unfair. Now, either he is clueless when it comes to labor management relations, or he is being very intentional. And since there's nothing in this story to suggest that he is clueless, we must assume, therefore, that his actions are intentional and purposeful. So what is Jesus trying to teach us through this parable of the vineyard workers? Well, first, Jesus affirms the Old Testament belief and teaching that God is just. Each worker received the amount of pay he had agreed upon before he began working, before he was hired to work. Those who went to work at 6 o'clock in the morning. They had a verbal contract that they were going to work 12 hours and be paid $200 for their day's work. And that was the amount that they got paid. That's exactly what they received according to their verbal contract. And then those who went to work at noon also got paid $200 according to their verbal contract. And even the ones who worked only one hour got paid $200 what they had agreed upon according to their verbal contract. God is just. Second, Jesus affirms the Old Testament belief and teaching that God is gracious. There was another song that the children of Israel learned in their Sunday schools. No, it wasn't Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, he is precious in their sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. It wasn't that one. That one hadn't been composed yet. Instead, they learned one that we find in Psalm chapter 86, verse 15. It goes like this. I don't know the tune, but so I'll just say the words. But you, O oh Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. It was a very popular song because we find variations of it all over the Old Testament. We find one variation in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. We find another variation in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 17b. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. We find still another version in the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verse 2, where Jonah says to God, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. We find other variations of it in Psalm chapter 103, verse 8, chapter 111, verse 4, chapter 145, verse 8, in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, in Joel chapter 2, verse 13. God is gracious and grants eternal life to all who believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, no matter when they commit their lives to Jesus Christ. Whether they do it as a young child at age four, five, whether they do it as a teenager, age 15 or 16, whether they do it as a young adult, age 29 or 30, whether they do it as an adult, age 40 or 50, whether they do it as a senior citizen, 
age 65 or 70 or 80, whether they do it on their deathbed, five minutes before they breathe their last breath. God is gracious and grants eternal life to all who believe in Jesus Christ. So how do we understand this parable? Is it a parable about fairness and justice? Or is it a parable about grace? There's an old proverb that says, when we get what we deserve, that's justice. When we don't get what we deserve, that is mercy. When we get what we don't deserve, that is grace. This parable that Jesus told is a parable about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And the kingdom of heaven is about justice. But even more, the kingdom of heaven is about grace. And if you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, your attention should not be on comparing what you get to what others get. You should be thankful for the grace that you have received. You see, Jesus wants us to stop playing the comparison game. One of the things that I learned early in pastoral ministry is that playing the comparison game is spiritually unhealthy. When I compare myself to other pastors, it can lead to pride. It can lead to me thinking that I'm better than them, that I can preach better, or that our worship services are better, or that... I have a better congregation that my co- than my colleagues do. Or it can also lead to envy, desiring what other pastors have. For example, <clears throat> I can desire or, or wish that we had more young, talented musicians who were part of our praise team, like a Hillsong Church or a Bethel Church. Or I wish we had 20 more people attending Wednesday night Bible study like the Baptists do. Now, playing the comparison is spiritually unhealthy for pastors, and it's also spiritually unhealthy for congregations. And yet we do it all the time. When we get together with our friends, when we go to church conferences, we compare our attendance at worship and Sunday school with others. We compare how many new members were, were baptized the previous year. We compare our weekly offerings with what the weekly offerings of other churches are. We compare how much money we raise for mission projects like Heifer Project with what what the church down the road is doing. Why can't we just be thankful for the grace we've received? Why does it always have to be a competition with another church, with another person? Why can't we be content with the gifts that God has given us as individuals and as a congregation? There's an old, an old Japanese story, a fable actually, about Tsuku, a stonecutter. Tsuku was a poor man who cut blocks of stone from a stone mountain He made a meager living from cutting stones that barely kept his family fed. And then one day, he saw a well-dressed prince parade by. And Tsuku envied the prince and wished that he could have that kind of wealth. How powerful that prince is, he thought. I wish I could be a prince. His wish was granted, and he was turned into a prince. Tsuku was happy with his silk clothes and his powerful armies until he saw the sun wilt the flowers in his garden. He wished for such power as the sun had. How powerful that sun is, he thought. I wish I could be the sun. And his wish was granted. He became the sun with power to parch fields and humble people with thirst. Tsuku was happy to be the sun until a storm cloud moved between him and the earth so that his light could no longer shine on everything below and his heat could no longer warm the earth below. 
How powerful that storm cloud is, he thought. I wish I could be the cloud. His wish was granted, and he became a powerful storm cloud. Tsuku was happy being a storm cloud. He was able to destroy the land with floods and storms. But soon he discovered that he was being pushed away by some great force. He realized that it was the wind. How powerful the wind is, he thought. I wish that I could be the wind. His wish was granted, and he became the wind, able to move clouds and sailboats and many other things along. Tsuku was very happy being the wind until he blew against something that would not move. No matter how strong and how hard he blew against it, it would not move. It was a huge stone mountain. How powerful that mountain is, he thought. I wish I could be a stone mountain. His wish was granted, and he became a huge stone mountain, more powerful than the prince, the sun, the cloud, or the wind. And Tsuku was happy being that huge stone mountain. He was more powerful than anything on earth. But as he stood there, he heard a hammer pounding a chisel into solid rock. And he felt himself being changed. What could be more powerful than I, the stone mountain, he thought. Tsuku looked down, and far below him was a stone cutter working away, cutting blocks to sell, to make his daily living. God is just, but even more, God is gracious. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We are what God has made us. Stop complaining that life is unfair and be thankful for the graces that God has blessed you with. Amen. For him a response, I invite you to stand and turn your hymn books to hymn number 150, Wonderful Grace of Jesus, hymn 150.
Now is the time for sharing of joys and concerns. We want to remember Steve Schrock in our prayers. Steve's mother, Dorothy, passed away this past uh, Tuesday evening, or Tuesday, and uh, the services were, visitation was yesterday, and the funeral was this morning out in Arthur, Illinois. So we want to keep Steve and his family in our prayers we also want to pray for Kathy Wells. She had surgery this past week. They have a pin uh, placed in her ankle to aid in the healing. So we want to uh, keep her in our prayers. She's not able to get around very well uh, with a <clears throat> boot on her ankle and is supposed to stay off her legs. So keep uh, John and Kathy in your prayers. Are there other things to lift up to the Lord this morning? Hi, this is Karen. To thank the Good family for coming over to Lafayette on last Sunday to help lease one house to another house. It was such a blessing to have them there, and it's a it just shows us what a reminder it is that it's such a blessing to be a part of this church family. So, help. This is Martha Corey, and as you all know, that it's been a long year for me, uh, for the Coreys, um, between the pandemic and, and all the things that we've had to do. Um, it's been a, a time of not much um, time to do anything here or anything for anything else. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and I know that one of the things that we're to do as a as a believer is to help where we can others that cannot help themselves. And that's been more of a problem, or I shouldn't say problem, it's been more of a thing that I thought I was taking on to begin with. But anyway, through this all, I have missed the things that I do here, the things that I do um, for others, others, and... Um, the television is on at our house so much, and it's on the news so much, and that's been a problem for me to hear that all day long sometimes. And I have been thinking, what could I do, Lord? This has been going on all the time. What could I do, you know, that I can, because my time is so much here, what could I do for you that, that I haven't been doing? Um, as I said, the television has been on so much, and um, the news is not good most of the time. And I keep thinking, you know, if our nation is to be a nation under God, the believers and the Christians are going to have to get busy and pray. Um, and I said, Lord, and I kept saying, Lord, help the Christians begin to believe that we need to pray for this nation and for the things that it stands for. Well, I got an answer that I was not, I was surprised about. And I, he said, you do it, Martha. You start the Christians. If you believe the Christians should do it, you start it. You do it yourself. And so I've talked to Pastor Mark, and we would like to start a prayer uh, between Sunday school and church, as we did the other time, for 15 minutes, to pray for our nation. It is not a political, it is not to um, say who we should vote for is to help our nation, to bring our nation back to God. If you listen to the news any at all, it the nation has got a lot of problems. There's a lot of things that we are not doing as believers. So um, if you would join us between Sunday School and Church, it, we're going to try to do it all of October and the Sunday, I think there's one Sunday in November before the election. And uh, so if you would join us in doing that, um, we need to pray for our nation. Thank you. We'll have more information about that in the newsletter.
So keep tuned. If that's all, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Lord of justice and mercy, we confess that we often quibble over perceived little injustices. We look around us and see mercy being offered to others when we feel that they have done little to merit such treatment. Our world is in such bad shape. There are true injustices and horrible situations in which peace and mercy seem to be dim and distant hopes. Give us eyes to see where justice and compassion may be offered. Give us hearts to reach out to those who are new in faith and who struggle in life. We thank you for Martha, who has heard you tugging at her heart strings and has come up with a way, Lord, that we can pray as a congregation for our nation and for all the turmoil and unrest that has been happening in our nation. And Lord, we pray that you'll hear us as we pray for our nation during the month of October. Lord, we pray that you would enable us and strengthen each one of us in your service, that we may offer peace and hope to others, not counting the cost, but sharing the wealth of your mercy and love. Lord, today we pray for Steve Schrock and his family. May your love and peace comfort them during their time of loss. We pray for Kathy Wells as she recovers from her surgery. Lord, we just pray that you would bring healing to her ankle and help her to have patience, Lord, to be able to uh, return to being able to get up and, and move around. Lord, we are thankful for the goods who were able to lend a helping hand to the Brickers last Sunday and move Lisa into her new home. Lord, help us to be aware of opportunities that come our way in which we can serve others. And by doing so, witness to your love and the grace that you have given us. Lord, we ask for your blessings upon our HPI walk this afternoon. We pray for the safety and protection of all who, who come to it and participate in it. Lord, we just pray that you would bless our efforts, that they may go to helping the poor in our world be fed and be cared and provided for. Lord, we continue to pray for Norm as he struggles with his headaches and depression, we pray, Lord, that you would encourage him and relieve the suffering that he is going through. Lord, we also want to pray for Joanne Ray and Pauline Eller, that you would continue to minister to them with your love. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we've had together here as your people to worship you, we pray that you would be with us as we go forth from here. Continue to lead and guide us with your Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For a closing hymn, I invite you to stand and turn in your hymn books to 71. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, hymn 71.
Remember that God shows mercy and grace to all. So go into the world where strife and injustices prevail and bring God's love to each one, not counting the cost, but rejoicing in the good news of God's mercy and love. And may God's peace be with you always. Amen. Thank you.